Hello, brethren and friends. It's good to be able to engage in this study today. I'm so very thankful for the Word of God and the teaching that we have, that we can learn from it, that we can know how to better live our lives. <clears throat> today I would like to talk about a topic that tends to get brought up from time to time with our family and our friends and people that we come in contact with. And that is the topic of social drinking. And often the question is asked, and it should be, and we should seek for a Bible answer for the question, is it acceptable to drink alcohol in all forms socially? So that's what we will study today. This will be a rather lengthy study. <clears throat> I have tried to somewhat go into some detail and look at various aspects of the topic in hopes that we can have a better understanding of what the Bible has to say and discuss some of the arguments that we often come in contact with when talking to individuals about this topic. First, I would like for us to kind of take a, a step back and imagine for you, if you will, this scenario that you died yesterday and your family, they have begun to reminisce about who you were. As they flip and fumble through your belongings, what would they find? Would they find things that make them proud and they would say, you could insert your name here. They would say things about you, maybe things, uh, what a Christian he was or she was. Look at the things that this individual has. This is an example of a Christian. Would they find an old Bible? Would they find letters of encouragement or dates recording the special times in life? Gifts that your family had given you, perhaps pictures. Would they find things, though, that would bring shame? What if they found an empty bottle or a half-empty bottle? One that you had been drinking out of shortly before you passed. What if they found things that they were so ashamed of they would hide them from their grandkids, from their kids, so that they would not taint the memory of you. Though they nor anyone else ever called you a drunk, nor they had ever even thought about it, or thought that you drank even a little until now, what would that mean for you? Let's examine what the Bible has to say about this problem. The problem of drinking. Is it acceptable to drink alcohol socially in all forms? You know, we often hear people say, doesn't the Bible speak of consuming wine? Didn't people in the Old and New Testaments consume wine? Perhaps we consume it casually today with or without food. Did Jesus not attend a wedding in which wine was served? Is there a limit to the amount of wine or alcohol that we could consume? Can I drink as long as I don't get drunk? heard that question before. Some have asked, isn't a glass of wine healthy? Doctors tell you that a glass of wine a day is healthy, right? Surely a doctor wouldn't give me bad advice. Alcohol, isn't it used in medicine? So what could be wrong with partaking of alcohol? The alcohol that we are considering is ethyl alcohol. There are several different forms of alcohol that we know of today. 
The alcohol that we are considering is ethyl alcohol. This is the alcohol. Listen to this very carefully. This is the alcohol that is con contained in beer, in wine, wine today and wine of the Bible times, although there is some differences in those. We'll, we'll likely discuss that in this study. The same alcohol that is in hard liquor, mixed drinks and all of those things, the list could go on. And it seems like every time we turn around, there's a different drink, a different concoction put together and different labels, things that we see of today. And of course, there are several different types of arguments that are made. Some are strong arguments. We'll address some of those. And then some are weak arguments. Perhaps a weak argument that you have heard is, well, there's not an explicit scripture that condemns drinking. We know that there are scriptures that we will mention later that condemn drunkenness. But where is the passage that condemns drinking? Well, that's a weak argument. And as we go through our study, I hope that you will see more how weak this argument is. What about the question of watching X-rated movies? Is that condemned explicitly in the Scripture? Well, no. There was no such thing as an X-rated movie. When the Bible was put together and all of these chapters and, and books were written by the various people and prophets that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. But we understand, even though that X-rated movies are not explicitly mentioned and condemned, it is implied that we should not lust. We should not be engaged in lascivious behavior or fornication and all of those things. So we understand that we don't always need an explicit scripture to condemn an action or whatever it is that we may be engaged in. On that same note, can you justify the use of cocaine or heroin? Those words are not contained in the Bible. The word drug, to my knowledge, is not contained in the Bible. There are words that could be associated with, with the drug. Gall, the word gall comes to mind that's often associated with a type of drug, a type of poison that would do things to the human body that would dull pain. But the word drug, cocaine, heroin, and the list could go on, those things are not explicitly mentioned in the Scripture. But we can understand that they are condemned because we understand the effects that those things have on the body. A well-known passage in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, the wise Solomon wrote, and the American Standard translates it this way, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, or is raging, as the King James says, and whosoever erreth thereby is not wise. Strong drink is raging. It's a brawler. Wine is a mocker. The wine under consideration here, the strong drink under consideration here, contains alcohol. The alcohol is what is being talked against. It is what is actually under consideration. It is the alcohol. It is, that is the compound. That is the chemical. That is the poison that is contained in the wine and the strong drink. The wine here is in reference to things, a drink made from the grape. Maybe red grapes. Maybe those white grapes. Maybe some other type of grape. That's where your wine comes from. The strong drink is not, in this passage, it is not a reference to whiskey 
Hard liquor, those things did not exist in this time. The strong drink here, and we'll look at this Hebrew word in a little bit more detail later, shakar, it is a drink made from something other than grapes, maybe dates or some other type of fruit that they may have allowed to ferment. It may not have fermented and they would drink it. In this context, in this passage, it is without a doubt the understanding of what Solomon is talking about here. We're talking about a fermented liquid that contains alcohol. He says, the King James says that it is a mocker. What does that mean? It makes you a mock, scorn, makes you look ridiculous, a brawler, or raging, to be troubled, to be turbulent. Alcohol is a mocker when it comes as a friend but it's really a foe. Think about that. You think this is something good? I can sit down at this, this meal and consume this liquid. Tastes good. Makes me feel good a little bit. Takes the edge off, maybe you say. But it's really a foe. Alcohol is a mocker when it promises you pleasure, but it actually brings you pain. Alcohol is a mocker when it promises you liberty, but it brings you slavery. Many people have become a slave to alcohol. They cannot do without it. They can't set it down. Alcohol promises gain, but brings loss. And I hope you'll understand that loss as we continue through our study. So why the draw? Why the urge? Let us look at the word wine in the Scripture. We have new wine and old wine mentioned in the Bible. And we, we could reference specifically the New Testament. But we want to look at the Old and the New Testament and look at some of the words that are translated as wine. Old wine, the wine or juice of a grape that has fermented or soured. This is intoxicating. And in the first century, in the New Testament time, this would have had an alcohol content by volume of 4 to 15%. That, was, that would be the max. The wines of today can be fortified. What does that mean? That means that more alcohol can be added. There's a process of distillation and alcohol can be removed from a liquid and separated and stored. Alcohol can be removed at a temperature that is lower than the boiling point of, of water. So the liquid doesn't have to boil, the alcohol can be removed and you, that's a distillation process. And so this can be fortified. Today, you can have as high as 200% or pure ethyl from vapor distillation. The earliest distillation processes were not known until the 12th century. So, think about it. If your argument is drinking the liquids that we have today, they are not the same as the liquids that they had in the first century. Specifically, if you just consider the wine... The wine today that can be bought has some differences. Now, there are individuals, I'm assuming, that could make their own wine and have some similar content by volume, alcoholic content by volume, but some of the things that you can buy on the store shelves are higher in alcohol content. There is new wine. So we have the old wine. The old wine is fermented wine. Wine, the word wine can reference grape juice or it can represent the alcoholic beverage that we know of today as wine. It can also represent some other things as you'll see as we proceed. New wine though, new wine is the juice of a grape that is unfermented. It is sweet. It is unintoxicating. 
So we understand the difference. Old wine, when we see old wine referenced in the Scripture, that's representing a fermented liquid. New wine is an unfermented liquid. It has no alcohol. Old has the alcohol. New does not have the alcohol. Some of the words in the Old Testament for wine, there are... There are many words in the Old Testament, matter of fact, that can be translated wine and they mean different things in different instances. But we will only look at a few. And this is a generic word. Yayin can mean fermented or unfermented. Depends on the context. And that will come out as we look at some of these scriptures. That this can be fermented or unfermented. And for instance, let's look at Numbers chapter 6 and verse 4. You could turn your Bibles to Numbers 6 and verse 4. That passage says, All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree. The King James translates that. That's the word yayin. We'll see later that that word can also be translated as wine. You understand now, while this is a generic word, context determines the translation. Context determines whether we are talking about a fermented liquid or an unfermented liquid. Here we're talking about a tree. There's nothing fermented on the tree. He's made from the vine tree, from the kernels, even to the husk. The word there is yayin, vine tree or grapevine, as it may be in other translations. In Judges chapter 9 and verse 13, And the vine said unto them, Shall I leave my wine, which cheereth God in man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So we have here again the word yayin, and the vine, the grapevine, that's the word yayin, said unto them, Shall I leave my wine? That's another uh, Hebrew word that is used. And I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but it is tyrosh, I believe is how you say it. And it means wine, fresh wine, new wine. This is freshly pressed grape juice, unfermented. Yet again, another Hebrew word to represent wine. Another instance in Isaiah chapter 16 and verse 10. What we're doing is we're building up some knowledge here of how the word wine is used. Isaiah chapter 16 and verse 10, And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine there's your word, yayin, in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. So the word yayin here is freshly pressed as well. There shall be no treaders treading out the wine. Those that would press out the grape juice would not be pressing out anything that would be fermented. Fermentation is a process that has to have the right conditions in order to take place. Here in the grape, freshly pressed, we have the word yayin used. And we've already mentioned this passage. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker. The word wine is yayin. You see how context determines the use of the word and what we're talking about. Here, yayin is translated as wine and we understand that it is Fermented. The negative effects of wine. It is a mocker. Strong drink. Here is another Hebrew word translated into something that has fermented and some believe also unfermented. I, I, I am of that belief in, in my research and study that this word can mean fermented or unfermented and it is shikar. Strong drink. It's always translated as strong drink, or I have not seen um, a translation where it was not. 
Shukar, strong drink, this is something fermented other than the grape. It is mostly translated as strong drink, but refers to drink obtained from dates, barley, maybe mixed with honey. This is not, yet again, this is not the idea of liquor that we know of today. And it can be both fermented and unfermented. And those are some words from the Old Testament. Let's step over into the New Testament and look at some words. There are not as many. If you looked at a list of the Old Testament words that could be translated as wine or such the like, the list is very lengthy. In the New Testament, there's not that many. But we're only going to look at two yet again. We looked at Yayan and Shikar from the Old Testament. We're going to look at Oinos and Sekira, which is a, a kin word to Shikar in the Old Testament. But oinos corresponds to the word yayin in that they are both generic in all stages of the grape juice from the tree to the container in which it's placed and the period of time in which it's in that container under the right conditions. Oinos. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 it says, And be not drunk with Wine, there's your oinos, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That is a reference to fermented. It's obvious. It talks about being drunk. You cannot become drunk on an unfermented liquid. Luke chapter 5, verses 37 through 39. And no man putteth new wine, oinos, into bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled. And the bottles shall perish, but the new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine, oinos, straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Here we have both words, English words, translated from the same Greek word oinos, meaning fermented or unfermented. An instance where Sekira is used in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. Talking of John the Baptist. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine, oinos, or strong drink. There's your Sekira word, which is akin to it, the Hebrew word Shekar in the Old Testament. And you'll see the connection here in a minute. I'll reference another passage. He shall neither drink wine nor strong drink, but he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist lived under the Nazarite vow that is mentioned in Numbers chapter 6. And in chapter 6 and verse 3 of Numbers, it says, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, yea, and shikar, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, nor vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes. He wasn't even allowed to eat just regular grapes. He had to abstain from all of these things. Moist grapes or dried. So he was to stay away from all of these things. And of course, so we see another word here, Sekira which can be translated as strong drink in the New Testament as well. There's another word, oxos, which is translated as vinegar, sour wine. And this was a drink that a Roman soldier would consume. The Roman soldiers were not allowed to drink alcoholic wine while they were on duty, so to say, while they were carrying out orders or, or whatever the case may be. And this vinegar, how did you get this vinegar? Well, it is a result of fermented wine that has, has went bad or it is wine that has not been allowed to ferment properly. So the alcohol is, is, is not in the liquid. It's, it's removed. It's vinegar. We know of vinegar today in, in different forms that, that we may use for different things. So oxos is vinegar. And it is a result of a, process, a, a separate process. You could, you could do some research on that on your own. 
a separate process, but you result in a different tasting liquid that has no alcohol, vinegar. Also, we could consider some means in which that the early church, those in the New Testament had, and even the Old Testament, had a, of preserving wine. They could preserve grape juice. They could preserve an unfermented liquid for long periods of time and not have it become alcoholic. You know, for a long time, I thought that you take grape juice and you squeeze it out and you put it in a bottle and, well, you, you got to drink it or it's just going to become wine by sitting in that bottle for a long period of time. You know, I have those images of those, those wine cellars and those bottles of wine down there and that, that was what I was thinking. Of course, when you, when you make wine, it, it's, a, it's a process and, and several things have to be lined up. Several things have to happen. And if you take one of those elements out, then you won't end up with that fermented liquid. So they had ways to keep their, their grape juice, to keep their wine, as they call it, from fermenting. And you can see here that I have listed you can remove the air. You remove the air and it does not ferment. You can boil it down to a concentrate. You can buy concentrated juice today. And what happens? What do you do with that? You add water to it. They boil it down. I mentioned a moment ago, even in distillation, when you boil something that may have alcohol in it, the alcohol comes out. You hear people using you know, these, these cooking wines and different things in these dishes. You may go eat at the Olive Garden or whatever. They may have very well used those. But the heat... And it doesn't even have to be the boiling point of water. It doesn't have to be that hot. The alcohol content comes out. And they could boil this down to a concentrate, save it, and then add water to it later to consume it. It can be filtered to remove the gluten. Gluten is a key factor in the fermentation process. And then there's other methods. You could do some research on that. But the fact is, I want to let you know that they were capable of preserving their wine, their grape juice, in unfermented forms in order to consume it. They did not just drink wine. The word wine, as we use it today, is not the same as the word wine in every instance in the Bible. It's different. 